So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Reproducibility Through Open Protocols, Opportunities for the Library, which is sponsored by Springer Nature. This session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Now I'll just put two links in the chat to where you can register for upcoming CHOICE ACRL webinars uh, or watch previous webinar recordings. So before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. We are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers or to share any comments. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. You can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions you like or would like to be addressed. Also, there's closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Annalisa Taylor, MLIS, is Head of Scholarly Communication at the University of California, San Francisco. Annalisa leads scholarly communication support and initiatives at the UCSF Library. She is an advocate for open research practices and has taught workshops and classes on open and reproducible science. Prior to UCSF, Annalisa was a science librarian at Bryn Mawr College and an engineering librarian at George Mason University. She holds an MLIS from the University of Texas at Austin and a BA from Sarah Lawrence College. And Lenny Tatelman is co-founder and president of Protocols IO. Lenny did his graduate studies in yeast genetics at UC Berkeley, and it was his struggle with correcting a published research method as a postdoc at MIT that led him to co-found Protocols IO. Lenny brings to Protocols IO a strong passion for open access, sharing knowledge, and improving research efficiency through technology. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Annalisa. All right. Hello. Um, hello, everyone. Nice to be here with you today. And I'd like to start out by thanking Lenny and Springer Nature for inviting me to talk about this topic today. And also thank you to ACRL Choice for hosting this webinar. Um, so first, starting out, we thought it would be good to just clarify what we're talking about when we say reproducibility. Um, so a definition of reproducibility is um, the process of obtaining consistent results using the same data, using the same methods, computational steps and code, and the same data analysis and conditions of analysis. A related term is replicability, which means obtaining consistent results across studies that are looking at the same scientific question, but for which each study has its own data. That said, I will be using the term reproducibility more broadly, more generally to refer to the process of obtaining consistent results um, using data and um, similar methods. Okay, there we go. Um, so you've probably heard of terms like the reproducibility crisis. Um, there certainly have been a lot of well-publicized uh, posts or studies that have shown that you know, really well-known studies that have been in published literature have not been able to be reproduced by other researchers. Um, Nature Publishing did a survey of over 1,500 scientists in 2016 where they asked them about their own practices and their own issues with being able to reproduce both other people's studies as well as their own with their own data. And what they found was that 70% of these researchers across different fields said that they had had experiences where they where they failed to reproduce somebody else's research results. And those researchers also said that it, when they looked at reproducing their own results, about 50% of them said that they'd had issues reproducing them. So we can see that uh, the graph on the right breaks down these, these differences or by the different fields with the 
top bar being reproducing other people's research and the bottom being uh, reproducing their own research. So this is clearly an issue and there's lots of different ways that research practices can be changed or improved in order to help make research results be more reproducible. Um, other definition we wanted to provide is what do we mean by protocol? So protocol can be a clinical protocol, it can be a research protocol, it can be an evidence synthesis protocol. And essentially what a protocol is, is detailed instructions for how research is conducted. The difference between methods and protocols is a method is can be described as the approach used to examine a research question, whereas a protocol is step-by-step -step instructions that detail the process for producing results using that particular method. Um, the two terms are often used interchangeably, which is totally fine. Um, you, you might think of methods as in like the method section of a research paper, and that's typically gonna be more like a summary of what methods were used for that particular research study um, and what tools were used, but not necessarily detailing the individual steps that were taken to um, complete those methods. So some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today are, are some fairly recent practices by libraries and by my library in particular at UCSF. But it's important to note that, that libraries have been involved with supporting research practices for many, many years. Um, so there are research methods and protocols resources that are published that are subscription resources from publishers like Wiley, Elsevier, Sage, um, and uh, some open access publishers as well. And these have been sub supported by libraries for, you know, for decades at this point. Um, I was, I worked in the field of collection development and collection management before I was in scholarly communication. And I noticed over years that there were more and more of these resources um, from like the, the current protocol series from Wiley, Sage Research Methods, the J Journal of Visualized Experiments that were sort of popping up and that libraries were subscribing to. So um, I, at some point decided that it would be good to sort of gather these and put these, uh, put them all together in one web page. Um, so that's what you're seeing here is a screenshot of that web page that's hosted on our UCSF Library Support Center, um, where I pulled together all of our subscription resources. Most of them we subscribe to throughout the UC library system, um, as well as some open access resources like the um, protocols.io, which you'll be hearing a little bit more about today. And I also added on there some resources for researchers to design or to write their own protocols and different types of protocols. Um, I know that we've got a lot of librarians who are on the, on the webinar today. And so I'll mention that we use Zendesk for our help center. We also do use LibGuides, but for certain help articles, we'll use Zendesk, which is a, a ticketing system that we use internally. So now talking about open science and how open protocols is related to open science. First, it's helpful to kind of look at what the scenario looks like for the traditional research workflow, which we can refer to as a closed science workflow. This is a graphic that my colleague Ariel Deerdorf and I use when we're teaching our Open Science 101 class as a way to sort of put open science in perspective. So, you have over on the left here, let me change my lawyer. We have a researcher here who's doing research. She is producing data. She's also writing code to do some analysis of her data and she's documenting her research processes. And all of these feed into and contribute to the publication that she then writes. That publication is the only uh, part of this research process that ends up getting shared publicly. However, in this closed science workflow, even the publication is behind a paywall. So on the other side of the paywall, we have a researcher who happens to have subscription access to this journal. And so she's able to get access to this journal article. We have a clinician who also has access through his institution. So he's able to get access, but we have an educator here who does not have subscription access. And so she is not able to get access to this article unless she pays a fee. Okay, let me get rid of those little check marks. So now moving into open science, um, I really like this definition from the group Foster Your Open Science, which is a, a European-based organization. And so their definition is that open science is the practice of science 
where others can collaborate and contribute, where the research data, the lab notes, and other research processes, including the publication, are made freely available, and that they're released under terms that enable reuse, redistribution, and re reproduction of the research and its underlying data and methods. Um, so reproduced or, or made available under an open license. And so if we look at our research workflow under an open science model, we see that the researcher, our researcher now is when she's um, releasing her data, she is making that data openly accessible, depositing it into a data repository. And this is something that might be required by her funder. For her um, protocols, she is making those openly accessible as well in a protocol repository. She's putting her code into a platform like GitHub or, or um, Zota uh, Zenodo, and then she's publishing her paper open access so that anybody can access it. And we can see that all of the users on the right-hand side of the screen can access all of these components if they wanted to, or if they just need access to, to one or the other, they can access them. Um, so we have a poll that we want to launch so that we can get a sense from you. Um, and our question is, how involved is your library or is your organization in open science activities? So if you could just choose which response best fits your scenario. And we'll give about 30 seconds for folks to vote. Okay, so looking at the results here, and I believe everybody can see these, it looks like uh, the largest percentages of, of the audience are somewhat involved in open access activities or minimally involved. Um, but we do have 17% who are very involved and then 7% that are not at all involved. So great, well, thanks. That's really helpful for us to get a sense for um, the involvement level and, and the um, familiarity with these topics within the audience, so. Okay, I'll go ahead and close that poll. Thank you for your feedback. Um, so moving on to talking about my library at UCSF and our involvement with open science with a focus on open protocols. A little bit first about our the context. So we are part of the University of California. There are 10 campuses in the University of California system. You see a map of where they're all located on the right-hand side of the screen. And the UC libraries are very much a collaborative group. We do practically everything collaboratively. We have a very elaborate governance and advisory structure. We have many, many UC libraries wide committees and groups, con um, common knowledge groups and so forth. And we do a lot of things collaborative collaboratively such as our licensing for subscription content, open access agreements, our discovery platform, preservation, digitization. And the California Digital Library is a part of this UC library system. You can think of them as sort of a, a um, 11th campus of the University of California system. They are located in Oakland, which is right next door to Berkeley, where Lenny is. Um, and they're part of the UC Office of the President. One of the divisions within the California Digital Library is the UC Curation Center, and they are the division that's most closely aligned with the open science topics that we're talking about today. So I'll mention them in a little bit more detail a little bit later. And then looking at UCSF specifically, uh, we are one of the 10 campuses of the University of California system. However, we're unique in that system in that we're exclusively health sciences university. We, have, uh, we don't have any undergraduate students. We only have graduate and professional students, and those number about 3,200. We have uh, 1,200 postdoctoral scholars, 5,000 academic employees, and that's separate from about 4,000 faculty. We have a very large medical center, and we have several locations throughout the city of San Francisco. The, the image that you see on this screen is the Parnassus location, um, and that's on the kind of western side of the city, and the Photo that you see in my background is our Mission Bay campus, which is on the eastern side of the city, just south of our downtown. Um, we're a very research intensive institution. We are uh, the top public recipient of awards from the National Institutes of Health, NIH. We have just under 1,500 awards from NIH as of 2023, which totals about $790 million. Um, so we're very NIH centric, although we, our researchers do get research awards from a number, number of other funders as well. 
And our researchers are very active with publications. They publish over 8,000 research articles per year. And that's just research articles, not counting review articles and conference proceedings and such. Because we are health, health sciences focused, the, the main avenue for publication is scholarly articles. We do have social sciences and humanities oriented researchers as well. So there are some book, there is some book publishing at UCSF, but it's really research articles. And so that sort of frames the context for our open science activities. Um, so in 2018, we formed a open science group at UCSF. This was established by myself and a postdoctoral scholar, a former postdoctoral scholar, Ibrahim Ali, whose photo you see at the far left of the, at the bottom of the screen, along with some other library personnel, as well as the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs, Liz Silva, whose photo is on the far right of the screen. Um, so we had some really good internal expertise and interest in open science. Our um, data services lead at the time, Ariel Deerdorf, and our data science lead, Carla Lindquist, who's a research scientist herself, are key players in this. Um, so we were really focused sort of at the library with organizing this group, although we did have key uh, key stakeholders in the postdoctoral scholar, Ibrahim, as well as our um, the associate dean, as well as some faculty members that were involved. So we started planning some events early on in 2018. And but the very first event that we planned was a um, an open protocol sharing or protocol sharing and publishing event. And we invited Lenny, who's a um, familiar face to you already. So Lenny, came over from Berkeley to present along with one of the faculty who was involved with the Open Science Group in its early days, Marielle Cavra. Um, and this was actually a quite well attended event, especially considering it was our first event that we planned. Um, there were a lot of early career researchers who attended because, you know, protocols and, and like research processes is something that's very near and dear to their heart because, you know, they're the ones who were doing all of the frontline research in labs, gathering data and, you know, doing bench research. Um, and so this was definitely an event that was of interest to them. We did organize some other events on other topics like related to open access publishing around our open access week, around um, preprint publishing, preprint sharing, uh, and peer reviews of preprints. Um, but then we decided that we wanted to organize a little bit more of an elaborate event which was a reproducibility workshop series. Um, so my colleague, Ariel Deerdorf and I um, organized these, these two series, uh, one in 20, 2019, which was fully in person since it was before the, the COVID pandemic. And then we had the next one in 2021, which was fully online. And what you're seeing on the, the right-hand side of the screen was the event page for this workshop series. You can see that we, the, um, the topics for each of the sessions, we had eight sessions and we invited in experts in all of these different topical areas. Again, we invited Lenny to come and talk about open protocols. Um, and we were lucky being in the Bay Area that we did have a number of vendors and publishers and industry experts who we could invite in. We only had to bring in one person from outside of the Bay Area. Um, but we did decide after the 2019 series that we would do more internally. So Ariel and I did more of the instruction and then we um, invited some of our instructors, some co-instructors from the UCLA library as well as uh, some UCSF faculty to contribute. So one thing that was, I wanna mention, mention about this reproducibility workshop is that one key element was this a collaboration with our graduate division. So I mentioned Liz Silva, who was our associate dean at the time um, and we designed the workshop series so that those graduate students and postdoctoral scholars from UCSF who attended the, the entire workshop series could get credit. It's a required training that they need to get as, as NIH awardees. If they're working on an NIH award, um, NIH requires these trainees to get eight hours, eight contact hours of training in responsible conduct of research. And they have to get, they have to do this every once every four years. And so we designed it to sort of meet those, those training requirements so that they could get this RCR credit. So the nice thing about this is that we were sure to have, you know, a core group of students 
who were taking each one of these eight workshops or seven workshops in 2021. And it was in collaboration with the graduate division who tracked the attendance and so forth. But we did also open up both of these, these series to people outside of those who were taking it for this RCR credit. We also did some before and after assessment, which I'll show a little bit more about in, in a couple of slides. And I'll mention also that we have shared, we've really tried to approach this, the work that we do with um, these open science initiatives. So we've shared the, the materials from both of the workshops for the 2019 series, the slides that were, that were um, presented during each of those workshops is, are publicly accessible. And then for the 2021 series, we've shared the recordings the slides and also the collaborative notes documents that are um, de-identified. Uh, Ariel and I also published a chapter in the scholarly communications cookbook. This is an ACRL press book that was published in 2021 um, based on our 2019 uh, series. And that chapter is available in the UC open access publishing platform e-scholarship. <clears throat> So for the 2021 workshop, this is what our, our methods and protocol session look like. This is when we had um, made a decision to try to use more internal resources to make this more sustainable. So we invited Ibrahim Ali, who is our the postdoctoral scholar who was involved with setting up the open science group at UCSF. He was at that time working as a sciences data librarian at the UCLA, UCLA librarian. Um, and also Stephen Floor, who's a faculty member at UCSF, who um, was also involved with the Open Science Group um, and is very much an open science advocate. Um, and um, taking a look at assessment. So this is the assessment process that we did for the after the 2019 series. And this you'll find in that chapter that we've shared on e-scholarship. So um, don't worry about trying to read everything that's on this slide. I just wanted to sort of give you a sense for the kind of assessment that we've done after each of these workshop series. So for each of the classes that were offered, we asked participants both before and after what knowledge, what their level of knowledge they felt was with for the topic for that course. So looking at the open protocols course, when you look at the pre, the, the knowledge of those who felt that they had extensive knowledge in open protocols with the little green bar there was quite low. Whereas after the class, those that percentage of people who felt that they have, had extensive knowledge had gone up quite significantly. And likewise, those who with the um, light gray bar at the top felt that they had only a little bit of knowledge before the class that percentage had gone significantly down after the class. And so this gives us a sense for how, how well we're translating the knowledge of that particular session. We also asked about their behaviors and what kind of influence having attended this class or participated in this class had on their likelihood to practice certain behaviors that were related to open science and reproducibility. Um, so looking at the question of whether they would be more likely to share their protocols after having attended that class. Um, looking at the blue bar, a little bit over 60% said that they were more likely to share their protocols as a result of this session. And a little bit over 30% felt that they were about the same with their likelihood to share protocols. And that could be because they were already willing or are already um, likely to share their protocols. And that could be that just they just don't have they're not at a point where they're in a position to share their protocols, which is totally fine. Um, and I did want to mention that um, when we teach our Open Science 101 class, when Ariel and I teach that, we always emphasize that open science, there's like a, a spectrum of practices related to open science. And we don't want researchers to feel that they're burdened, that they have to do everything because researchers are so busy, they have so much on their plates. But we try to emphasize that these are all, um, you know, we think these are more reproducible practices, but we want people to just pick the practices that feel like resonate with them and that will be the most useful for their research purposes. Um, and then we, we transformed the reproducibility workshop series into a credit-based course in the fall of 2022. This was, again, Ariel and I were organizing this course and we um, 
actually taught a little bit more of that ourselves as well. So we the only class that we didn't teach in this series was the methods, protocol, and codes class. We again invited Ibrahim Ali to teach that class. Um, and again, this was offered for credit for just for graduate students this year. So it was we changed it up in a way that it was since it was a credit based course, there was assignments that student had students had to complete in which we had to grade on a pass fail basis. Um, and we've also shared those materials on our collaborative learning environment platform. Um, our Open Science Group has morphed into a Bay Area-wide open science group. So UCSF, Stanford University, and UC Berkeley are um, have now an, a Bay Area open science group. You can find more information about that group at the link that's provided here. And um, it, these are really based out of the libraries. So the three library, the libraries at these three campuses are where these groups are based and where most of the people who are involved with them are centered. There's a monthly meetup that focuses on a different topic of open science. Um, and a lot of the materials are shared, including some of the recordings and collaborative notes documents. And another activity that we that's a collaborative activity related to open science that we're involved with is Love Data Week. So this is an international event, but there's a UC-wide version of Love Data Week where there's um, all sorts of programming related to data sharing, data management, data preservation, basically all things data. Um, so now shifting to talking about how open protocols and open science is supported through at the UC or at the UC wide level. And um, so I mentioned the UC Curation Center, the University of California Curation Center, which is UC3 earlier. This center is at the California Digital Library, and the, the director for that is John Chodaki. UC3 produces some resources like the data management plan tool, um, and they've uh, contributed to the Dryad data um, sharing platform. But on today's topic of, of protocols, um, the uh, UC3 took up a UC-wide subscription to protocols.io um, in 2019. So we've had access now for five years or just almost five years. And if you're not familiar with protocols.io, this is a, a platform for sharing detailed protocols by researchers. So any researcher can create a log into the site and add their research protocol. They can they can uh, make it so that it's only accessible to them or to a research group that they're part of, or they can share it publicly. So the great benefit of, of sharing protocols publicly on this site is that anybody, any individual can freely access the content that's been shared publicly by other researchers. So it's a really great resource for um, research, for researchers and for collaboration amongst researchers. Um, the subscription model is what that supports is it supports more the private use of the platform. And so that's where we get the benefits of having a subscription. So I'll show you what a sample protocol looks like on protocols.io. This is a protocol that was written by a UCSF author, Stephen Flores, our um, faculty member who was also involved with the Open Science Group. Um, you can see that also Stephen Flor has created a, a, a group for his lab. And so there's a number of individuals um, that use the platform for his from his lab, and they've shared protocols, multiple protocols within his group. This particular protocol is called Preparing Chemically Competent E. coli for Transformation, and you can see that it has a DOI. So every protocol that gets published on this platform has its own DOI, so it's a citable resource. And so the researcher goes in when setting up a protocol goes through and adds information that's relevant to running this particular procedure. So Stephen has added an abstract here, summarizing what this protocol is for, what it was adapted from, and what you need to do before starting. And then further down on the screen, you see the actual steps that are involved. So broken down into sections and then individual steps. So if I'm, if I'm an individual who's looking at this protocol on the protocols.io platform, I'll see this little box next to each and every one of these steps. I can then interact with this protocol. I can ask a question, if I, like if I have a question for clarification of this particular step, I can ask it here, that's gonna signal, that's gonna ping that the um, authors of the protocol 
and then they can then respond to that. So you can have this sort of interaction and collaboration amongst researchers. You can also run protocols on the platform and then individuals can do things like bookmark, they can make a copy or they can fork this and then you know make modifications to this protocol for their own purposes and they can keep it private if they want to. And then um, one of the nice things that I also wanna show about how the protocols look is the metrics that are provided. So I, if I'm a researcher who created this protocol, I can go in and look at how many people have viewed this protocol, how many people have exported it or bookmarked it. And you also see that there's a little indicator that other researchers can indicate that they've run this protocol themselves and that it worked for them. So that gives some extra validation. And you know, this kind of research activity is becoming more and more important as research and research assessment is trying to move away from just focusing on citations to scholarly literature, but looking at other ways that researchers are contributing to their field and other outputs that have value aside from just the publication. As a um, subscribing institution, we receive a quarterly report from protocols.io. So, so this is what that report looks like. Um, you can see that this is a report for 2023. And then I included what the report looked like in 2019, which was the first year that we had a subscription at UCSF or at the University of California system. And you can see that in the early days, our, our growth was you know, very substantial just because it was such a new product. And so researchers were now were doing more promotion of the product. Um, that growth is not as significant now, but that's something that is totally to be expected because the product, we've now had a subscription for several years. And so um, the growth is not going to be the same as it was at the beginning. You'll also notice that the number of private protocols, so these are protocols that are um, added on the platform, but that haven't yet been sh shared publicly. And those number much higher than the public protocols. And that's actually totally fine. You know, we love the idea of people sharing their protocols when they're ready to, or if they feel like it's appropriate for their work. But we, you know, one of the purposes of our subscription is to support that private protocols use. And so having that subscription enables more um, storage space and more, you know, large, more group members that can participate in, in these private groups. Um, and so that's one of the benefits of our subscription and why we um, started a UC-wide subscription. And lastly, let me get rid of all those check marks. <laughs> um, so lastly, I'll point out that I've included in this slide some additional resources that might be of interest to you. A couple of them are available from the UCSF library. Our Bay Area Open Science Group produced an open science team agreement that you might that you should check out if you're interested in open science. Um, and also wanted to shout out to the reproducibility research resource that's available from the University of Utah Health Sciences Library. It's a real, also a really great resource. And then some related resources are pre-registered research studies. I think that's another interesting topic that we could have an entire webinar on, uh, but it's also something that's related to protocol sharing. Um, the idea of pre-registering research studies so that the um, idea of transparency about what the um, what research methods are going to be used and then sharing what the results are regardless of what the, whether they're negative or positive. So that's the end of my slides and I am going to hand it over now to Lenny. And welcome your questions, um, which we'll address in the Q&A portion. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much, Annalisa. And um, for, for those who are wondering if I'm going to talk for another half an hour and there will be no Q&A, uh, be, between the two of us, we very much structured it so that I will just talk for 20 minutes to follow up because uh, this was so comprehensive, um, to follow up on the impact of the five years that UC has had. Um, the site license to protocols IO, just a little bit more on, on top of the information that Annalisa already showed. Um, but I also wanted to take the opportunity, so I'm not going to do any deep dive demo of protocols IO. I think Annalisa did an amazing job of mentioning the, the key benefits um, of, of the functionality, but for those who are interested in learning more about the platform itself, 
uh, the open access side of it that's free to read, free to publish, and um, is the public knowledge sharing of protocols that we actually started as a mission to encourage and improve reproducibility of what researchers publish and the credit that they get. So that's the free side of protocols. I hope you want to learn more about what the institutional plans are. There will be a poll in the end to get in touch with us for more of a demo of the functionality. And if you have questions about the institutional um, subscriptions, but what I really wanted to focus on is the impact that these partnerships have on adoption of protocols IO, the power that the librarians have to bring tools and best practices uh, in the way that UCSF has been doing. Um, and UCSF is just a beautiful example, um, as you've seen, uh, of connecting with the researchers and encouraging uh, better practices, but it's not the only one. And we've worked with a lot of universities. So I'll show a little bit more of what that impact is, um, and also just what the impact is on um, initiatives like Protocols IO in terms of uh, the ability for new tools to uh, survive uh, if you're, whether you're nonprofit or um, for-profit, um, when you're creating something new, the support of the librarians frequently um, at least in the case of Protocols IO, um, was uh, something that allowed us to survive. And I think it's not an exaggeration to say that we wouldn't be here without it. Um, and I want to show a slide from a 2015 talk by the Dean of Libraries at Carnegie Mellon, uh, Keith Webster. I should have, I should have added, uh, there's a link to it, uh, but I forgot to add Keith's name. So this is Keith Webster's slide that I saw in 2015 at a conference where he was talking about the changing landscape of the role of the librarian and that he sees that there will be more and more um, interaction with researchers and opportunity to not just think about what content we acquire, but to think about how do we support researchers and their workflows and get them to um, do better research. Um, and in the poll that I think, Annalisa, you shared, it also is obvious how much has changed in the last 10 years. So we launched in 2014. I remember this presentation being striking. And um, when, I, when I talk about the role that librarians have had on Protocols IO, not just the adoption and bringing it to the researchers or signing up for the institutional license, but on the platform itself, um, even though we were very lucky to have um, grant funding from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, from the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, whether you're for-profit or non-profit, you do need to figure out how to be sustainable. And the funders were asking us, um, what is your plan after the grant funding ends? Um, how will Protocols IO be sustainable? And uh, eventually we figured out that um, we do need to charge for it. So we'll have the free side if you're sharing openly, but we do need to charge for private collaboration, which is what Annalisa was talking about. Um, and it really is not an exaggeration to say that if not for the progressive libra librarians that starting 2019 um, saw the value of not a journal, but a software tool, and how we can help in the push for open science and better reproducibility. If not for that early support, um, we would not be able to get the grant funding. We would not have been acquired by Springer Nature, which puts us on a, a you know, trajectory to sustainability and long-term longevity and not just an experiment that you build something and then you can't figure out how to make it something, a tool that lasts. Um, so Carnegie Mellon became the first university to sign up for Protocols IO. And uh, it was their legal department that are, wrote our first site license contract because we couldn't afford, afford to pay for uh, legal work to, to create the contract. And then CMU said, oh, you can share our contract. Uh, with others, uh, if it's helpful, and uh, University of California a couple of months later signed up. Um, I think some of the librarians in that year, 2019, 
um, who supported us and brought us to campus and then signed up for Protocols IO are actually on this call. So I want to thank the people that I know it's unusual to sign up for software. It's um, a little bit of a risk to bet on a startup, on something that's new, that is not sustainable yet, that hasn't been around for 50 years. But I really wanted to say from the founder's perspective that um, it made all the difference for the ability of Protocols IO to exist today, that early support in 2019. And because UC was one of the first ones, um, we have now five years of uh, data on what happens when a university signs up. And you can see that um, in, the, in this chart, just following up on the numbers that Annalisa was showing, you can see what happens both for private and public sharing. And uh, I think this is quite interesting that um, if you compare to all of protocols IO um, when the university signs up, so this is uh, UCSF specifically, but it's a very similar, uh, very similar trend that we see for the entire UC system and for all of the universities that have signed up for protocols IO. Um, so as you would expect, because you're not limited for the number of private protocols that you have in the workspace, as Annalisa said, everything becomes unlimited. You can use it in teaching and in research. So in blue is the number of private protocols per user. Some will have like Stephen Floor's team. Some will have 40 protocols. Uh, I'm making that up. I didn't look up. I'm not disclosing any information, but there will be workspaces where there's 40 protocols, there will be workspaces where there's just three. Um, but overall, the number of private protocols, um, for obvious reasons, because you don't need to pay and it's unlimited, goes up. But what is really interesting is that if you look at the public sharing, what we also see is that um, having a subscription to Protocols IO over time, I think it takes about two years from our analysis, having more private protocols then translates to the researchers sh um, sharing more frequently in the public mode. Um, so it's not just internal reproducibility that goes up at the university, but they're more likely to share. And my explanation for it is that um, if you're learning of protocols IO when you're submitting a research paper and uh, the author guidelines of the journal are encouraging you to uh, share the protocol and protocols IO, it's a little too late, right? You now have to create an account. You have to put the protocol in. It's even more work and everyone is stressed and overwhelmed and it's a lot of work to submit a paper. But if your protocols, if you're using it privately and your lab's protocols are already there and the protocols you've been using in the research are there, you're using the run functionality, you're using it for collaboration and tracking your work and organizing the methods long before you're publishing, then Protocols IO actually helps you publish. It helps you uh, write the method section uh, and makes it easier. And I think that's why we see that jump, not just in the private sharing from the red to blue, but uh, on the public side uh, in the same way. And when we look, um, we did this, I think two years ago, when we look across, not just UCSF, but across all of the 10 campuses of University of California, um, you can see that um, the UC researchers are 2.6% of all of the users on protocols IO, um, but they have twice as many private protocols. And when you look at the public side from 2019 to 2022, they increased um, from 2% of all the protocols on the public side to UC now having 8% of all of the 17,000 public protocols that scientists and researchers have shared on protocols IO. So it's consistent with that jump, not just in private, but in public sharing. And it's not just UC specific, but it's something that we see across universities um, that have a site license. And we are now um, heading into Q&A. And before I um, turn off the slides, I also wanted to say that um, the training that Annalisa was describing, she showed links to all of the materials that they've prepared. Um, but 
I also wanted to highlight that Center for Open Science also has modules on reproducibility. They've made all of them public. Um, so there's a lot of material there if a library wants to get involved and want, wants to encourage uh, more reproducible, whether it's for code, data, or um, reagents, or protocols, um, more, more reproducible research methods and reporting. Um, this is a really good way to do it. And if you don't feel comfortable presenting yourself, so you don't have faculty you can partner with, like Annalisa was describing, um, for a very low cost, actually, Center for Open Science will do webinars and will uh, can uh, do that training and run those reproducibility um, modules um, for your researchers. So I think that's a fantastic initiative. Um, there is also reproducibility for everyone that I want to give a shout out to. There's a little bit of conflict of interest because I help to um, co-create uh, this volunteer-based effort. Again, all of the modules for um, the training that we're doing, the workshops that we led as part of R4E, they're all available at this link. You can take them, reuse them, um, adapt them, adapt them as necessary. And for protocols specifically, um, we have, you know, obviously we have protocols webinars where we go over the functionality, how to publish, how to use it for internal um, collaboration. But we also have um, a webinar that we run or we do it in person uh, at some conferences or events uh, that's called the Art of Writing Methods. Um, and you don't have to be an institutional subscriber. You don't need to have premium. If your university would like um, us to do that webinar, um, we are happy. And it's not just protocols IO specific. It's a webinar on best practices for how to write protocols, how to make them more, more reproducible, more discoverable, and just tips on doing that. Um, so um, the content from these is available. There's some recordings of them, but if you think your researchers would benefit from it, we are happy to do that. And with that, I think we are transitioning to the Q&A part. Great, yeah, thank you so much to Lenny and Annalisa. Uh, looks like we have about 12 minutes or so to answer some questions. So if you haven't put a question in the Q&A yet, feel free to do so. You can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions you'd like or would like to be addressed. Um, to start, we have a question here from David who asks, at what point do protocols, code, data, move from being researchers intellectual property to being fully open after publication in a peer reviewed journal article or at some point earlier? Annalisa. Yeah, so I think um, it, it somewhat depends on what, um, like if your funder is requiring that you share the, the data. At, at this point, funders are really focused on data and publications. They haven't been requiring uh, protocol sharing or, um, or code sharing, uh, but it's more like best practices. I don't know if there are any journals that have re required um, code sharing, um, but I think that it's typically like there are some journals that do require that you share your data at the time that you've, you submit to them. And so, you know, it's not the, Lenny could probably talk a little bit better than I can about like what that looks like with that data sharing. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean every single data element that you have, but um, data that's needed in order to verify, to, ver to validate the results within the paper. And so that has to be shared at the point of submitting for publication. I think really the protocols and the code could be shared at any time. I think it's very useful for a, if a researcher is submitting something for publication um, for that code to be available at the time of publication as well and the protocols as well. So, um, and Lenny could also talk about, you know, how some publications are integrating, like I think PLOS, you have a relationship uh, but, you know, so putting something in the method section where you say here, a link out to here's the detailed protocols. And so I think having all of that tied to that publication is really valuable, but there's certainly circumstances for doing it outside of a publication. Lenny, yeah. do, you, do you want to yeah. weigh in um, on I, that? 
I, I can just add, I think you're exactly right. Um, there aren't typically requirements to share before publication. Um, on Protocols IO, we do see that maybe half of the protocols that we see go live and become public um, do so when a paper is accepted and they're part of a paper that's being published um, or right after publication. Um, at the same time, half of the protocols that people share, they're like, this is a technique I've been working on. Um, I just want credit for it. I want other people to be able to do it. Uh, it's not, you know, it might take me two years to finish the research. Um, so they will just click making make it public. It's it doesn't prevent publication ever. We've in the 10 years since we launched in 2014, we've never once had an instance of someone getting into trouble that they shared a protocol too early. But I think for code and data, um, a lot of the platforms, they allow you to embargo and make sure that things go live together with the publication. Um, and there are funders, more and more funders that will require not just data, but code, like the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative makes it clear that they want you to put out a preprint. They expect code on GitHub. They expect data to be shared. They expect protocols to be shared, but they don't require it to be the moment you've gotten the protocol to work. So on protocols IO, it's at the discretion of the researcher. Um, if you feel comfortable, the earlier, the better from our perspective, but we we'll leave it in the hands of the researcher in terms of if they prefer to wait for a paper to be accepted and it's part of a paper, then uh, it's very easy to make it, make it public only after um, the publication. Great. Thank you both. And before we go to the next question, I'll just uh, launch a quick poll here that you all can fill out. Okay. Um, so we have a question here from Sherry who asks, would you protect the information or wouldn't you protect the information until the patent application is filed? So sort of another question about um, when to uh, make make this data public, that sort of thing. I don't know who wants to handle this mm -hmm. one. Lenny, do you want to address that one? Um, it, it, it does come up, sure. Um, it does come up, um, but you know, in terms of prior art, it's the same, um, the same considerations that apply to the publication in general. So the 17,000 public protocols that we see, they come from academics. If they're going to be publishing a paper, uh, they're ready to share it. Most of them are not applying for patents. Um, there is use of protocols IO in biotechs and pharmaceuticals, and they just disable publishing, right? So they will not share it period. So if there is a patent concern, then you don't want to prematurely click publish on that. Um, but I think for most academics, they will know if they're planning uh, to work with the tech transfer and the IP office, right? Um, and if they are planning to file for a patent, and in that case, both the paper itself, the results, and uh, the protocols, you want to be careful um, when you disclose. Great. Thank you. Next question um, is for Annalisa. Um, how do you decide whether to focus on promoting better sharing of protocols versus code versus data if all are important for reproducibility? Um, yeah, good question. I think it, in our, our approach at UCSF Library has been to kind of focus on all of the above because not, not all of those components are gonna to apply to every researcher. So in the, in the class that we do, so Ariel and I teach a class that's, we used to call it Open Science 101. Now it's like, I think, open and collaborative science. Um, and so we focus on those four components of publications, protocols, data, and code. Um, yeah, data and code. And we sort of just talk briefly about each of them. Um, and then in the workshop series we've done, but I think having some individual events like we, like the one that we offered in 2018 that was just focused on protocol sharing was also really useful because you can definitely get, I mean, when we covering each of those topics in like one, like in a one hour class, like you can't really go into very much depth on that. Um, so I think it somewhat depends on what the group is and like what we've done before. I think that like 
that event that we did in 2018, that was great to start with that because, um, you know, researchers, and let's, I will, I'll say this too, in our, in our workshop series, the proto, when we get the, look at the feedback that we get from the students or the participants, a lot, a lot of them will comment that one of the most useful things they learned about was the protocols.io platform, if they weren't already familiar with it, because they're often struggling with trying to reproduce methods in their in their own lab and they often struggle with like okay I can't you know I'm following this published procedure or I'm like looking at this research article and they're just not giving really a lot of good information and so they're often really seeking to have that detailed information in order to do better get better results themselves great yeah Lenny go ahead oh I think you're muted I know there was a question for Annalisa, but I just wanted to add that when we would teach the reproducibility for everyone workshops, we would always start by saying it can be overwhelming, um, like all the things you need to do to make it perfectly reproducible, but no one's work is perfectly reproducible. You can't do it perfectly, right? If you spend all of your time annotating your code and data and not doing the research itself, you'll never publish. So you won't be perfect and you just start with the things, you know, with small steps on some of the things and um, you you try to improve a little bit over where you were with the last paper. But um, we always recommend that the researcher just chooses what they're going to spend a little bit more time on, but you can share everything perfectly. Great. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also add to that just that like when we've had events that were just focused on open access publishing, it's not, I, I hear this from other libraries too, you just don't really get that much of an audience. Because I think for one, I think people feel like, oh, I know what that is already, but things that are more practical, that are going to be like a skill that's learned or learned about a resource that's going to help researchers, that's the kind of thing that tends to draw more of a, an audience because it needs to be something they feel like they can take away from it, that they can actually apply, so. Great, thank you. And I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, let's see, for Lenny, how common is the increase you showed for UCSF at other universities? That one, um, so I did say we see it broadly um, on, uh, the platform overall, but there is variability between universities. Um, so if the librarians are more involved and um, they organize events and they promote reproducibility and they invite us on campus or for um, webinars, there's more people that are just aware of protocols IO. And then there are some where if you're a little bit more hands off, um, it's more organic and it's slower. So there is variability. Um, so I, what I showed in the slides is the average, um, but it does vary. And then there are of the 40 campuses that have a site license for protocols IO, I think there are one or two that see the private increase, but we don't really see the public sharing. And the, you know, it's been, a while and just for some reason, maybe it's the fields, but there is adoption privately, but not publicly. So we do sometimes see that uh, it's there isn't a corresponding increase in the public sharing, but that's rare. Great, thank you. I know we're almost at the end, but I'll just sneak this question that just came in uh, from Charles who asks, does protocols.io focus entirely on biomed biomedical methods? And what fraction comes from other SciTech fields? For the great question, we used to, when we launched, it said, uh, re, you know, repository for life science methods. In 2017, we broadened that to all research methods are welcome here. Um, and there are many journals that are not biomedical and recommend protocols IO. Um, so we do see physics, we see social sciences, we see anthropology. Uh, protocols uh, in economics, even in data science. Um, so it has been broadening, but because of my background in genetics and life sciences, there is a bias towards it from our earlier days. But we welcome all research methods and have examples uh, from 
broad swath of fields. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're at the end here. So I'll wrap up and say thanks so much to Annalisa and Lenny for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to our attendees for your questions and comments. I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program. So be on the lookout for a follow up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the webinar and hope to see you again in the near future on another session. Bye-bye. Thank you.